What is up everyone? It's been a while, but hopefully worth the wait. Now, this box here has been sat in my office for almost a year. Uh, it is March 2022. I think I purchased this machine in around May or June of 2021. So I can't believe I managed to kind of resist opening it all this time. This would have been unheard of of me back in the day, um, but I needed time to unbox it for you guys. So here we are, months and months and months after buying the machine. So quick story in this box, as you can see by the title, we have a 2013 trash can Mac Pro. Uh, I bought it from Dave over at Geekanoids. When he first got in touch with me and said, hey Tom, I'm selling my 2013 Mac Pro that he's had for years and years. I think he bought it when it was, you know, properly an awesome machine. It was like the latest and greatest from Apple and he's been using it ever since. Um, he contacted me, hey Tom, I'm selling my 2013 Mac Pro. Do you want to buy it? I was like, no, I can't do it. The value of the machine is still too high. Um, it's still a decently quick machine, so they do tend to sell for... Uh, a price that you're not really chucking around 40 or 50 quid for an old iMac or something, you know, these sell for hundreds of pounds. Um, but then he messaged me again and we had a little chat and yeah, <sighs> one thing kind of led to another and here's the machine. So I've got the machine and I really, really was not expecting to own a 2013 a Mac Pro anytime soon. I thought one would eventually cross my path in the future, maybe five, six years from now down the line when they're cheap as chips and we can just sort of throw them about like we do with old, you know, one comma one Mac Pros and stuff. Um, but yeah, we've got a 2013 Mac Pro, we're gonna do something with it. I've got absolutely no idea what, but let's start by opening the box, freeing this thing of its, well, box. <laughs> because it's been sat here for months. Let's see what we've got. First of all, I'd like to draw your attention to the dust on top of the box. I'm not sure if you can actually see that, but we do have legitimate dust because um, <laughs> the machine has been sat here. So let's use the world's worst scissors and rip into it. I believe this is the original shipping carton from Apple. Um, and we have the original box in here, so let's try not to mess things up too badly. We have opened it correctly, and yeah, this is, as you guys can see, just like everything I've bought from Dave in the past, still the original shipping container and the original box and everything just looks absolutely perfect and hunky-dory. Um, so let's pull the 2013 Mac Pro out. <laughs> Look at this, look at this. In the bottom of the box here, we've got some of the sort of clear packaging and stuff that would have been around the machine. Probably all the stuff that's really difficult to put back on once you've taken it out. Let's put this to one side. This has got to be either the third or the fourth machine I've purchased from Dave. Um, we bought the 2011 Mac Mini, had some good fun with that. And also a little PowerBook G4 12 inch. I bought some other bits and pieces from him in the past as well. Let's bring you guys down a little bit, not too much because under my desk is a horrible mess. Yeah, that's cool. So we've got this bit of clear plastic on the top. I'm actually gonna put that in with the rest of the bits of plastic and whatnot. Yeah, so here we have it, an almost pristine condition, or I would in fact say pristine condition, um, 2013 Mac Pro box. Now, I'm gonna use this opportunity to address one thing really quickly because of course we're gonna be chatting about the machine in this video. Um, as someone from the UK, it kind of is very jarring for me to call this a trash can Mac Pro because the word trash can isn't really in my vocabulary. So uh, I'm just going to refer to it as the 2013 Mac Pro. Absolutely nothing wrong with calling it the trash can. But since this machine came out and people started calling it the trash can, it just doesn't sound right coming out of my mouth. So I'm just going to refer to it as the 2013 Mac Pro. Hope that is okay with everyone. So. Here we have the lid. This is crazy thick cardboard here. Ah, because, because, because this little thing is hiding in here. So we have our uh, documentation. Knowing Dave, it's all completely perfect. Untouched, yeah, even Apple stickers, look. Black Apple stickers, that was a big deal at the time. Big, big deal. So yeah, it's all still in there, really nice. Now I'm gonna keep all this really nice 
um, in terms of condition because the reality is, folks, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to keep this Mac Pro in my little Mac collection that I have simply because of the amount of money that it cost me. Um, I may have to get another in the future if I want to have one. Oh, why have I put that there? It goes there. Yeah, because eventually these will drop in value and they will drop in value pretty quickly. They probably have um, since I purchased this, to be honest, but I got this for quite a lot of money below what you would typically pay on eBay for one of these machines. Um, I've actually forgotten the spec of this specific model. I just want to show you guys before I take it out the perfection of the packaging. <laughs> Look at that. And you know, like hats off to Dave as always for uh, keeping it perfect. Now in here we have the machine as you can see. Now from what it looks like to me, this has been cling filmed and I'm presuming Dave chose to cling film it because the plastic wrap was not going back on and giving the machine adequate protection. Man, that is probably twice as heavy as I thought it was going to be. Oh my gosh. And then we have the power cable in the bottom of the box. And do you know what? Is that a normal kettle lead? If it is, I'm just going to leave that in the bottom. I'm not going to take that out. I'll just use a different kettle lead because I can then keep that packaging nice for... Uh, for the box there and if I need to resell this and whatnot. So let's just take a closer look at the machine. This is definitely cling filmed. Yeah, to my knowledge, Apple did not cling film their machines. You know, I'm gonna have to be careful here because if I just go crazy at it, it might be impossible to actually take off. I should find the beginning really and unwrap it. There we go. Oh yes, now. We're getting somewhere. Okay. Whoa. So here is the machine. Really quite bizarre to see one in person once again. I've seen a few of these in person out and about, um, but even all the way up until just a couple of years ago, it was much more common to see the Cheese Grater Mac Pros in professional environments over these. And then you just sort of saw 27 i 27-inch uh, iMacs pop up instead of these machines um, but you know these these are um, not that rare or anything they they're out there it's just they're not out there in anything compared to the numbers of uh, cheese grater machines um, so here it is it is a round sort of barrel bin shaped block of shiny craziness um, it does weigh a lot way more than I thought it was going to uh, but the design we all know we all know the design by now, um, but it is still absolutely marvelous to look at and just think, this is this is what it is inside. <laughs> it is it is bonkers, isn't it? Because you would look at this, nobody would look at this on your desk and say that is the computer. You know, it looks like some kind of air purifier gadget these days or something. When you look at it, um, not not a multi thousand pound computer because these were flipping expensive for some of the configurations when they came out. And one of the other kind of crazy things about this machine is just how long Apple was selling it and how outdated some of the features and specifications were for the money they were asking for it. Um, and that's when we got the whole iMac Pro debacle happening when they tried to, you know, uh, refresh the desktop for the Pros. And then eventually we got the new Mac Pro um, replacing this guy. But yeah, in those later years, this was flipping expensive. Um, so let's just take a little tour around the machine, I guess, like we do with all the machines we unbox and take a look at. Uh, the top is kind of cool because it's like one giant handle. You can pick up the machine from the top. You're essentially holding the outer case here, but in the middle we have our, um, what do they call this? Thermal core, I think, and you can feel the cooling vents around here. So you'd either get your airflow coming in or going out. There's vents around the bottom vents at the top. I can't remember what way. It probably pulls in the cool air from the bottom, blows it out the top. Um, we will check up on that though. I haven't refreshed my memory on anything Mac Pro 2013 related before filming this video, but before we start getting into the nitty gritty and chatting properly about the machine, I will uh, do my research so I'm not giving you guys loads of misinformation and making a fool of myself. Um, bottom of the machine, let's take a little look. 
very nice and clean Mac Pro designed by Apple in California. And what was cool about these is they were assembled in the USA. That was a big deal at the time. So for ports, we have got our power for the internal power supply. Um, that just adds to the beefy, bulky feeling of the machine, uh, but cool that it's integrated because this is a very small computer, so there's no external power brick floating around. So power supply, HDMI, power button, two ethernet, six Thunderbolt ports, absolutely crazy. Uh, because obviously there's no internal expansion and you were going from a machine with PCI slots and multiple hard drive bays and all this stuff, all of a sudden to a machine with next to no upgradability, they needed a way to connect loads of these external devices. So this was how you did it. Four USB ports and then our audio ports at the top. Uh, we've got one little lonely Apple logo above the ports and then we have this switch, flip and <laughs> my first time ever doing this, lift that off and <laughs> whoa, look at that. Man, no matter what your opinion is of the 2013 Mac Pro, that is cool. That is cool, 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 cool. So that you have a sense of where we are uh, coming around the machine, taking a look, we've got the ports at the back. So let's kind of go uh, around this way. So we've got two sticks of RAM in here. You can see we have two RAM slots there and then we are straight on to the first GPU. So this entire section here is GPU, I believe. And this is, well, the GPU is under here, and this is like the graphics card, if you like. And we also have our SSD sitting here. You can unscrew this and pop it out, I believe. In terms of upgrade options, I'm not entirely sure for this machine. Here's our second GPU. So as you can see, almost the entire outside of the machine, because the, the machine is a cylindrical shape, but the inside is just triangular, um, because we obviously don't have cylindrical PCBs. So these, uh, G these graphics cards, these GPUs are straight. Um, and then coming around, all we have the other side of this one is our other two RAM slots, which as you can see are empty in this machine. And we're back around to the ports again. So that is all you can get your hands on. Everything else is deeper buried within the machine. Your power supply, your CPU, logic board, everything that is in there, you can't see, you know, this, that, and the other fans, blah, 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 blah. But you can at least use standard memory, pop it in and out, and you've got uh, room for expansion on this particular Mac Pro. Uh, I guess this is RAM from the factory. We will attempt to take it out. Let's have a little look. There's an arrow there. Push. Oh, okay, cool. So you push that inwards and it kind of unlocks the RAM. Uh, it just pulls out. Yeah, it just pulls out like that. So we have got in here 16 gigs of DDR3 on that stick and the same on that one. And there's no Apple stamp, so that is aftermarket memory. And it kind of begs the question, uh, why aren't these slots populated with the original memory? There must have been a reason, um, maybe sort of channel mix matching stuff going on here. Um, must be a reason why Dave didn't do that. We will find out. You could get to 64 gigs on this machine quite easily by just adding another two 16 gig sticks on this side. That would be pretty cool. Um, but possibly rather unnecessary, depending on what the rest of the configuration is like, and of course, depending on what you want to do with it. So let's put the lid back on for now. We'll get it set up, I think, and, oh, that's nifty, you just lock it into place. So it's got, there's a lot of resistance to the lid, and it slides down quite, quite smoothly. You've got a bit of, a bit of clunking that happens there, but it, cushions onto the bottom nicely and then you just lock it into place. So I'm going to pop the Mac Pro here-ish. <laughs> it looks great. And I have a spare monitor at the moment because my Mac Mini is only connected to one monitor. So up here I have a secondary monitor we can use exclusively for the Mac Pro. Unfortunately, I don't have my KVM switch handy. Uh, it's buried in the attic somewhere. So I'm going to have to get an additional keyboard and mouse here. But what I may do is install some kind of app to share the keyboard and mouse once I get the Mac Pro up and running properly. But for now, we will uh, 
just get an additional keyboard and mouse. I get a power cable. I've got ethernet handy for this guy here. I've got everything handy. So let's plug it in, boot it up, see how it goes. So I have the Mac Pro sitting behind my monitor and I've got a keyboard and mouse temporarily plopped there. And it is connected to the top monitor. Now it's gonna be a little bit of a weird angle for you guys um, to see the screen at the moment, but you know, hopefully you get the gist. Uh, let's get back here and jab the power button. Feel for it on the back. Okay, three, two, one. Now I did hear it make a sort of, ooh. Don't know if you heard that through the mic, but there's a bong. And here we go. The machine is booting up. Very, very nice. And we are straight into the setup. So I'm gonna quickly blitz through all of this, get it set up, get it sitting on the desktop, and then we'll have a little nose around the spec of the machine. The first thing I wanna comment on is the noise level of the machine. I simply cannot hear it in my room because I've got a really loud room anyway. Uh, I've got my network rack that makes tons of noise, and above me I've got a skylight that you've probably heard through the video just clicks and clunks away when the wind blows outside. Um, so the Mac Pro, when I put my ear right up to it, I can hear some sort of little noise of just kind of, it's not even fan noise, it's just, I can hear that it's on, um, but anything more than that, you know, nothing, it's just silent. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if we can get it to ramp up and actually audible above my other stuff. So let's have a look and see what the spec is, because it's been so long since I bought this machine, I've completely forgotten about this Mac. Let's have a little look. Okay, so, so we're running Catalina and it's a Mac Pro late 2013, we know that. 3.5 gigahertz, six core Intel Xeon E5 and that is just one CPU. So it's a six core machine, 3.5 gigahertz, 32 gigs of 1866 megahertz DDR3. And for graphics, we actually have the AMD Fire Pro D700 six gig. Now, there were three different graphics cards you could choose for this machine. You had the D300, the D500, and the D700. The D700 was the highest end card available for this machine, and of course you get two of them. So if we jump into system report, you can see under graphics, we have two of them, two PCIe GPUs, slot one, and slot two each with six gigs of graphics memory. So at the time when this came out, yeah, the Fire Pro card's pretty nice, but they quickly faded uh, into being not so great in comparison to eGPU options. Uh, but the D700 is the best that you can get within the Mac Pro, so it's pretty cool that we've got a D700. Uh, one thing that I find bizarre about this configuration, and it's all flooding back to me now from when I purchased the, the machine, I may actually ask Dave about this, or he may explain in a comment below why when he bought the machine he chose this configuration, because I would have thought more CPU power would have been beneficial. Um, maybe an eight core machine and then a D500 GPU um, at the time of order, but who knows, you know, um, maybe the acceleration on the GPUs was pretty desirable. Uh, for video work at the time, not 100% sure, but it just seems, especially compared to configurations that I see on eBay, if you see D700 GPUs, you tend to have an eight or a 12 core Mac Pro. Um, this isn't the lowest end CPU, you could get a quad core, one of these, um, but this is sort of not close to the highest end CPU either, so six core machine. We'll have a little look on Mac Tracker, in fact, Let's have a little look right now. Handy thing about having two machines right here. So jumping into Mac Tracker quickly, we can see that we do indeed have four, six, eight, and 12 core models uh, ranging in processor speeds, 3.7 for the four core. It gradually goes down the more cores you have, the slower the actual clock speed. So 3.5 gigahertz on the six core, eight cores at three gigahertz, 12 cores at 2.7 gigahertz. Uh, caching, we are looking at 10 megs on the quad core, 12 megs on the six core, 25 on the eight core, 30 on the 12 core of L3 cache. Uh, this is an Ivy Bridge machine. So that shows you kind of the age 
um, just how old we're talking. You know, we are now year 2022. We're looking at a decade old architecture here on the 2013 Mac Pro, which is pretty crazy considering how long we were selling this machine for. Um, let's have a little look. Yeah, discontinued in December of 2019. So, wow, 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 that is pretty crazy. I've just converted the unit price over to Great British Pounds. Uh, this six core would have been £3,299. And then I know for a fact that that GPU upgrade from the D300, which was stock on all of the models, I believe, um, the upgrade, the jump up two levels to the D700 was a damn expensive upgrade at the time. Um, so this would not have been a cheap machine when Dave originally ordered it. Um, but, you know, look how well the machine has done for Dave all this time. All those videos that it's created since he originally bought it. Um, pretty incredible. Storage available on this machine, 256, 512 or a terabyte of flash storage. Quite hefty for the time. Ten years ago, well, nine years ago, terabyte of flash storage. But that would have been damn expensive from Apple as well at the time. Uh, We've already covered the graphics. Maximum memory at the time, you could order 64 gigs from Apple, but she'll take 128. But yeah, here we go. So on the graphics side, we are looking at the Fire Pro D300s. They are two, two gigs of graphics memory, three gigs on the D500, and then six gigs on the beastly dual Fire Pro D700s, um, up to six external displays, Thunderbolt uh, or three 5K displays. Yeah, dual display extended, blah, blah, blah. HDMI is 1.4, just gigabit ethernet on this guy, of course, no 10 gig ethernet. The Thunderbolt ports, the Thunderbolt 2 ports, uh, 20 gigabits per second ports. This was before Thunderbolt 3 and all USB-C stuff and that. This was a fair bit before all of that sort of thing. Some of the legacy stuff that this Mac Pro ditched from the cheese grater model, just to kind of give us an idea of where we were at the time with these systems. Uh, the last cheese grater Mac Pro still had Firewire 800. Seems kind of crazy now because Firewire, when you say it, just sounds ancient. And I was using Firewire all the way up until really recently. Um, but even I now think that when you just say the word Firewire, it's like a proper old school thing. So this machine ditched Firewire 800. Relatively pointless having Firewire on board a machine that has this much Thunderbolt capability. But, of course, Music studios, especially at the time, Firewire was a huge, huge deal. So getting that little dongle was just an extra kind of complication at the time. Um, dedicated digital audio in out ports were replaced, but the audio jack here is a mini Toslink compatible, but of course you need another adapter for that as well. Um, it ditched the super drive. You could put two super drives in a cheese, cheese grater or any uh, DVD drive for that matter and they were SATA drives in the later ones as well. Or a DVI port. Uh, DVI was taken away, rather it wasn't using a dedicated uh, traditional graphics card, so um, choosing to put a DVI connector here would have been very non-Apple-like anyway. DVI was kind of incidental on the Mac Pro cheese grater because it was using um, just slightly modified proper graphics cards, of course. Uh, DVI really easily achievable by a HDMI to DVI adapter, which is exactly what we're doing for our monitor above. And you can also go from Thunderbolt out to docks and all sorts for DVI and things, so not really a problem. But there's a running theme, and it was a running theme at the beginning of this machine's life and all the way through its history, and that was the fact that everything you wanted to do with it, you needed a shed load of adapters and dongles. So it was relatively similar to plugging in a MacBook Pro, um, but this thing was just a big cylinder on the desk and didn't have a built-in display, but you need equally a similar amount of adapters. Of course, yeah, you get two Ethernet ports on board and that, which is nice, so you don't need like Thunderbolt to Ethernet adapters and things that you would need with the newer MacBook Pros, um, but still, you need quite a lot of dongles and stuff to get this connected into your workflow. Bearing in mind that most workflows are pretty accessory heavy in the Pro environment, so uh, yeah, these days not so much of a big deal because we really have transi transitioned a lot of stuff um, over to kind of external Thunderbolt devices, USB-C devices, and simplified a lot of the stuff that was kind of done at the time. But losing just the PCIe ports or the PCIe slots, I should say, was a huge deal. We of course lost as well 
the four 3.5 inch internal drive bays. Um, <laughs> instead, we've got the proprietary PCIe flash and for pros at the time, that really sucked as well because nobody really cared. Yeah, it was a nice quick boot drive, but people wanted to be able to bung in massive hard drives that they could do with the Mac Pro uh, cheese grater. That wasn't possible anymore. It was all external. So that's just a quick little overview. We will talk more about the Mac Pro um, in like a little sit down bit in the end of this video or in the middle of this video or something. Um, but let's get back to looking at this particular machine. So carrying on with the specs on the displays, we know our display, we know our GPU. Let's have a look how much storage this guy has. So this has the middle storage option. It's not a terabyte, it's not 256, it is the 512 gig option. And we see 499.93 gigs of that. Loads is free because we've got a fresh install, so that's good. Memory, two slots in use, two slots available. It is almost tempting to see how cheap these 16 gig dims are at the moment. Um, just bunging another two in would be pretty awesome actually, because we'd have uh, 64 gigs in this guy. Pretty nice. Uh, and that is, yeah, that is everything about the machine. Um, so using the machine, as you'd expect, feels super snappy, super responsive. Uh, everything about it is really quick. Yes, it's nearly a 10 year old machine, but the tech inside isn't too dissimilar in terms of basic everyday capability to what we have today. Um, it's not like we're using a mechanical drive or an ancient system. This is still a relatively capable machine where you will notice the difference between today's machines and this machine is when you get into intensive workloads, it will simply take longer. And in some cases, take significantly longer um, because one, one drawback to the Xeon CPU is uh, something that I've talked about at length before, and that is the lack of quick sync. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the consumer side, so on the iMacs of the time, even the 2014 iMacs could smoke this guy on H.264 video uh, with the Intel acceleration that this guy didn't have. Um, there's all sorts of interesting comparisons on YouTube and stuff at the time, because by the time this Mac Pro came out, um, tech YouTube and everything was in full swing. Um, so it's kind of unusual for me to unbox a machine and talk about what I see now as like a, definitely a legacy machine. I know it's still supported, but um, pr a pretty old machine, um, but I remember it coming out and I remember seeing videos about it at the time. I remember it like it was yesterday. I'd already finished college, I believe, by the time this actually released. So uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's still feels really recent. It's crazy how fast the, the last few years have gone. But anyway, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to get this guy updated. I'm going to use it a little bit, see how it feels. And then we'll resume the video at a later date and we'll do some direct comparisons. We, we're going to, we're going to see what this guy can do. We'll do some comparisons between this and the M1 mini. I'm expecting the M1 mini to pretty much destroy the 2013 Mac pro, but it'll be interesting if we can get the Mac pro to beat the mini in something. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll also have a sit down discussion face to face about the Mac Pro and about my kind of views of it and about how much of a bizarre machine that it really is in the history of Apple. Because I think it gets glossed over a lot. Um, not a lot of people talk about it anymore, but when you actually sit down and think about it, it is a very pivotal, interesting point in Apple's history, especially in regards to their Pro products. Because uh, we all know how Apple kind of swayed over to just the consumer side for the longest time, but thankfully that doesn't appear to be the case anymore. Anyway, I'm gonna enjoy using my new uh, trash can Mac Pro. I'll throw that in there for you guys. I'm gonna enjoy using my new Mac Pro and uh, I'll give you guys an update once I know what the machine can do. Here we are just a little bit over a year later we're back checking out the 2013 Mac Pro. So let's have a little look at what's going on. I do apologize for the uh, slight delay. So currently it is 35 degrees in this network cabinet. We are having beautiful weather in the UK at the moment, but it does mean that it is very, very hot in here. And here is the machine itself, of course. Now this has been sat on my desk for the last year since I unboxed it. So at least it's been no longer sat in the box. It is actually out. I've been using it ever so slightly with Catalina. But what I'm trying to do today is update it. So I had about 20 minutes of fun with the App Store, 
trying to get it to download macOS Monterey, 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 however you say it. Um, but it just wasn't playing ball with with this machine for some strange reason. Just wouldn't want to download it. Mac Mini, it's downloading it absolutely fine, um, which is crazy because this is obviously on Ventura, the newer one. So um, I'm downloading the previous version of macOS because that is now the last supported version of macOS for this machine, which is quite interesting. So when I first started recording this video, we were supported on the latest OS, we no longer are. And it's also become slightly more exciting because the 2013 Mac Pro now is rapidly approaching its 10 year anniversary. It's now 2023. So 10 years of, of trash can Mac Pro which is cool. Um, talking a little bit about the setup because it's a bit clunky at the moment. Bottom monitor is my main machine, my Mac mini, and that's the keyboard and mouse for it. And then I've just got a temporary keyboard and mouse and the temporary top monitor hooked up to the Mac Pro. Um, my second one of these died, third one's in work. So I've downgraded to the little 20 inch Dell 2009 W. It'll be fine for now, but I will swap it onto the big monitor um, ready for the actual proper stuff that we do, the proper coverage. But right now I'm just trying to get the OS on the machine. I booted into recovery just as a kind of quick give it a go thing, but obviously it's only letting me download, I think Yosemite through this method. So that's not gonna work. Um, I'm basically just waiting for the download now to take place so that I can transfer it to the Mac Pro and then install it like that. So that'll be fine. So hours and hours have passed. Um, it is now pretty late and I've got somewhere with this machine. So I've managed to download the Mac OS installer and all it did was throw up an error on my Mac mini because it's an older version of the installer. So obviously that's fine. I've just transferred the installer straight over to the Mac Pro which worked brilliantly, but I'm not going to install it right now because I'm downloading uh, a game because I thought that would be pretty fun. I've downloaded the newest and most demanding game that I own for Mac OS, which unfortunately is not that new and not that demanding. So I'll have a little look and see if I can get a hold of something else, but this will be fine for now. Um, it's Alien Isolation. So, you know, it will run pretty beautifully on this Mac Pro, I presume, but it'll be fun to crank it all the way up and see if we can get any stuttering or anything happening on the Mac Pro. That'll be really fun. Um, but I will investigate other games tomorrow. Unfortunately, nothing else I've got is Mac OS compatible in terms of PC games. Um, nothing new anyway. I've got like older stuff that is, and I've got loads of old Mac games, as you guys know, but nothing that's gonna really test out this system. Um, so I'm going to wait for this to finish downloading and then I should be able to start the macOS installer. That means when we come back, I will have a fully up to date system as far as it can go because that's crucial. I want it to be as, as up to date as possible for the comparisons that we're going to be doing. We are finally up and running with a fully up to date Mac Pro. So top monitor, Mac Pro 2013, bottom monitor, Mac mini M1. We're gonna do a couple of little side-by-side -side comparisons. Not too many, because we could get bogged down in that, and then there's no real point to drilling into how the Mac Pro compares to one specific machine, but it will give us a kind of idea, because the M1 Mac Mini is a really good representation of just your general everyday Mac from this sort of era, which is a decade on from where we were with the Mac Pro. Now, it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, of course, because we're taking the Pro machine and we are comparing it to the pretty much the most consumer Mac desktop you can buy. Um, and they've updated the Mac Mini since as well with the M2, but obviously we're all still fully aware of the capabilities of the M1 Mac Mini. Um, so what I'm basically saying is this is just more of a little bit of fun. And so we can kind of get that point of reference and see roughly in the ballpark where we are. So let's take a little look at a couple of side-by-sides um, or rather up and down, top and bottom, because I've got my displays this way. It's gonna be a little bit awkward, but hey, we'll do what we can. Okay, best camera angle in the world. Here we go, we can see what's going on. So let's start both of these tests. They don't need to be started at the same time because it's only the numbers that we really care about. So this is Blackmagic Disk Speed Test, and it gives us a really good idea of what the internal drives are doing. Now, at the time when the Mac Pro 2013 was re released, 
there was still a plethora of different storage op options available across all the Macs. So you could get some Macs with hard drives, some Macs with SSDs, some Macs with Fusion drives, and there was all sorts of configuration options. It was definitely right at the very beginning of when everything was changing over. Flash storage was still really expensive. Um, but at the time, the 2013 Mac Pro had fast flash storage. So we have got uh, kind of a proprietary M2, M.2 um, SSD in the Mac Pro 2013. It's, it's a proprietary Apple connected drive, but it's essentially just an M.2 drive connected to a PCI Express 2.0 4X slot, I believe. Um, so looking at the kind of performance we get out of it. This has been running for a little while now. Up here on the Mac Pro on right, we are getting just under a gigabyte a second, so that's around 945. And then for the read, we are getting just under 800 megabytes a second. Now, that is a little bit slower than I would have expected. Um, I'm not sure if that's just because of the amount of use the machine has had. This is a fresh install, or this could be completely accurate for a 2013 Mac Pro. But if I had to guess, I would have guessed that it would have scored a little bit more than this. But obviously this is still a fair bit quicker than your bare basic SATA SSD, which is what most of us would have been using at the time if we did have an SSD at all. It would have just been a SATA SSD, um, which would have capped out a fair few hundred meg below this score. So that's nice and speedy. But fast forwarding 10 years, what have we got going on in Apple Silicon? As you can see, huge, huge differences, especially on the read. We're nearly at three gigabytes a second. Now the M1 is super speedy on um, drive performance, just very, very quick. Um, yeah, and the writes there as well, 2,364 megabytes a second. So around 2.3 gigabytes a second, which is just unreal when you look at that. But look at those two chugging away there. As you can see, it really does give us an idea of what's what when we can see video wise where the differences lie okay but as you can see the mac pro internal storage is still fully capable to keep up with um, some of the most demanding tasks there just quickly reflecting on that test and thinking about it for a second it is fascinating where we're at with storage right now because when the 2013 mac pro was current every little difference helped in terms of storage. You could feel every difference. So it may be a bit of an extreme example, but back then it wasn't uncommon to use a hard drive as your boot disk or around that time period. Um, the upgrade from even a 5400 RPM to a 7200 RPM drive in your laptop was significant. It was considered a worthwhile upgrade that you would spend a lot more money on because it was much quicker. That's obviously going back a few years before the 2013 Mac Pro. But then around, around the time of this machine, when we were transitioning over to SSDs, SSDs were, were becoming affordable they were a sensible option to choose to put into a machine. That jump then from the 7200 RPM drive to the SATA SSDs was absolutely gigantic. There was a huge speed increase, and obviously, still to this day, it is the quickest way to speed up an ancient machine, just swap the drive for an SSD. And then another huge leap when we go from the SATA 3 interface SSDs to anything else, so the PCIe stuff, um, obviously like the new lovely Apple fabric connectivity in these Apple Silicon Macs that is just blazingly quick. Um, that stuff is, is lightning quick. And even this PCIe uh, 2.0 storage interface, super, super quick in the 2013 Mac Pro. You're talking nearly a gigabyte there. That will feel so quick around the OS. Um, and I think we're at a point now where we're just getting revisions of the PCIe generations. The storage is getting a little bit quicker, a little bit quicker. You can spend quite a bit of money on M.2 drives and get quicker storage than the much cheaper options. But then you're down to performance. You're down to what is that drive doing for you? Whereas back then, if you were getting the 2013 Mac Pro, it may have been your first machine with, it probably was your first machine with the PCIe storage, the PCIe flash storage, and that would have been an immediate, immediate, obvious, huge increase in something that made the machine feel a lot quicker. Um, yeah, 
fascinating and we're at a we're at a wonderful stage with storage now and um, looking at doing a couple of future projects generally just outside of this sort of thing um, and looking at where we're at with storage and how affordable things are we're at a lovely stage now it's just fantastic the drives that you can get in the speeds and the compa and the capacities for the price incredible um, but that's a discussion for another day okay back to the 2013 mac pro so next test we've got handbrake open here and we are going to take a three gigabyte full length feature film it's just a sort of compressed uh mov i believe no it's an mpeg4 file sorry so it's a mpeg4 copy of 2012. i often use this film for testing because it's right at the top of my movies folder and it's a good good little size around three gigs so what we're doing is we're using a preset and handbrake to just compress this down to uh just a normal preset fast 480p 30. um we could choose anything it makes no difference for this test so that's what we've chosen i'm going to hit both the mouse buttons at the same time and then i'm going to hit my timer straight away and we're going to see what finishes first now it should blast through this on both machines because it's also a standard definition file it's a slightly different resolution so it will be doing some conversion um but let's see what we get let me get my timer ready okay here we go three two one go okay oh <laughs> brilliant obviously i'm doing desktop to desktop and it hasn't renamed the file bear with me one moment i'll have to make a folder <laughs> okay that was fantastic so let's go oh hang on timer oh man okay that was fairly entertaining let's go three two one go we are going on both machines and i've got my timer going Okay, this is exciting. So annoyingly, Handbrake doesn't have that big blue progress bar anymore. So let's just zoom in to where we're at. It's going at 280 FPS on the Mac Mini. And it is going at... Not bad at all. Around 180 FPS on the Mac Pro. So... Hey, you know, I was expecting the Mac Mini to be about double the speed, but the Mac Pro is definitely clinging on there, crunching away at that. That is fantastic. So I'd say, I guess, we are averaging maybe about two thirds of the speed of the Mac Mini, maybe even three quarters the speed of the Mac Mini from the Mac Pro, which is really quite impressive. One super obvious difference straight away is uh, in classic Mac Mini M1 style, it's stone cold to the touch with most things you do. And then the Mac Pro, even though it's not ramped up like crazy, I got it to ramp up with something crazy yesterday and I'll show you that later. Um, yeah, it's not going bonkers. It's not boiling, boiling hot either. So let's have a little look at uh, activity monitor for both machines. Yeah, it's fluctuating a fair bit, but it's generally similar loads that handbrake is placing on the CPUs. Let's just have a little look over here at the CPU load graph. 1,466 threads on the Mac Pro, 2,159 on the Mac Mini. Yeah, looking at our average FPS, we've got 180 versus around 280, give or take. So about 100 FPS more on the Mac Mini. The other thing, of course, to mention is we are now talking radically different architectures. It's not just the difference in age and the generational difference. It is, you couldn't really have a more different system. The only thing that is similar between the two is the fact that they're running vaguely the same operating system, um, but not even that. So it is actually, quite interesting it's like again going back to the power pc days doing that intel to power pc c comparison we're doing it here again and i have to say the, the uh, good old 2013 mac pro is really really clinging on but we'll talk more about the history of the machine later on in the video and the pricing and stuff for the money that some people paid for this thing very recently it should definitely be able to hold on and compare to a Mac Mini, which is a fraction of the cost of what these were. So, yeah, it really does depend on the way that you look at it. And that's what makes this such a fascinating machine is how long it was sold and how expensive it was. Okay, 
<laughs> so the Mac Pro is getting pretty toasty. Ah, the Mini's heating up a little bit as well. The Mini is heating up. They've been crunching away at this for nearly 10 minutes. So nine and a half minutes. So we're at nearly 86% on the Mac Mini and just over 55% on the good old Mac Pro. Of course, with these long, long workloads, that's where you really feel the faster machine because they will compete much sooner. It doesn't stay proportional. Uh, it, you just benefit from that speed more and more as the intensive workload increases. Average 277 FPS, and then, you know, still about 100 FPS below on the Mac Pro. But again, that heat difference is absolutely unreal absolutely unreal okay let's wait and see okay 1324 on the mac mini let's see how long we've got left on the mac pro reckons another seven minutes on the mac pro we are still down in that 65 percent neck of the woods okay so 20 minutes 42 seconds or i messed up the clock a little bit you could shave off about 10 seconds um but yeah 13 30 minutes, 24 seconds versus around 20 minutes, 30-ish uh, seconds. So yeah, that's pretty substantial, but the Mac mini was not twice as fast. So that's one thing it's got going for it. It didn't double its speed, which is quite cool. Okay, so next up is Geekbench. Now we're not gonna get too bogged down in the numbers. We're just doing this mainly for a bit of fun. Uh, but let's run the benchmark on both of these guys. So go. This is the CPU benchmark. We will do the other benchmarks as well. Why not? Let's just see what we get numbers wise. I do apologize for the sun. Uh, the sun is coming in through the window, making it nearly impossible to see. I'm going to try and sort that out right now. Okay, nearly, nearly. Okay, that was good. Might be a little too dark in here now. Let's see if I've got a light. Ah, we have an interruption in the benchmark. Hang on, is it still running? Yes, it is. Okay, it's still running. It's just asking me to use my uh, iPhone as a webcam. I don't want to do that. We've kind of transformed from daytime mode to nighttime mode now, but I'm kind of hoping that that blackout blind will help a little bit with the uh, heat situation as well. I've got to say this because I reckon it's a good time to say it. Something else has just popped up on the screen now. And I remember way back when I switched to Mac, one of the biggest advantages was you didn't get stuff all over the screen all the time, pop up, pop up stuff. Hey, do this, do that. Have you seen this? Check this out all the time. And I feel like in recent years, Mac OS has become a lot more shouty. It's like, look at this, look at what I can do. Look, look, look all the time. Um, and I think a lot of the reason for that is because Mac OS can do a lot of little things, especially like the iPhone integration stuff, the webcam iPhone things and, and all the stuff that it can do with the iPhone and the iPad. Um, it just needs to constantly shout about them because people don't know that you can do that stuff. There are so many features and so many like cross-platform, cross-device features um, in the operating systems now that, you know, I don't know half of what it can do. So it has to shout about these things. Like the Mac Pro just asked me now, do I want to take a tour around? I know it's a fresh install, okay, I get that. But it's like, come on, can't you detect that I'm running apps, I'm running benchmarking apps, just detect that I'm doing something, I'm using my computer right now. Now is not the time to shout at me and tell me, hey, do this, do that. Scores are in for my Mac Mini. Single course score of 2,364, multi-core score of 8,566. Let's see how that compares to the Mac Pro. So there it is. The Mac Pro has scored 716, the single, sc single core score, and 3,537 in the multi-core score. So over twice as fast multi-core, uh, the uh, the Mac Mini there, and over three times as fast um, for the single core. So yeah, the Mac Pro is still still carrying some really hefty power there for its age. Ten years old, uh, seven years older than this Mac Mini, but of course you are looking at the highest end, most pro desktop versus the lowest end. Uh, consumer desktop, so take that into consideration. These are all just numbers. It's good fun to look at, but. Uh, not much more than that in this kind of comparison. So let's take a little look at the graphics. This is going to be an interesting one. Now, one thing that I am really intrigued about with the graphics is uh, we have got obviously the most kitted out graphics option in the Mac Pro. So we've got the 2D700s. You could not put 
anything quicker in this Mac Pro. So let's do a compute task for OpenCL first and compare. OpenCL, so yeah, Apple M1 on the compute device there. And of course we've got, oh, okay. So we have to select, because we've got two GPUs in this machine, we have to select just one of them because that's something to um, interesting to take into account as well, that not everything would be able to leverage both of those cards. So let's run this and see what score we get. Mac Pro is finished first. Oh my gosh, this is this is wicked. Okay, let's see, let's see, guys. Come on, come on, Mac Mini. Oh man, check that out. <laughs> Love it. The Mac Pro with the D700 has beat the Mac Mini. So, oh, Mac Pro, pat on the back. 27,779 for the OpenCL score on the Mac Pro, 20,439 on the Mac Mini. Okay, that is cool. Let's take a little look at... Man, it's getting confusing with these keyboard and mouse stuff. Let's take a look at Metal. This could be a different story. Here we go. So again, you can only select one card. What's the difference? Okay, Compute Engine, OpenCL, and then that's just the Fire Pro D700, okay. So yeah, again, you can only select one card, so bear that in mind. Let's rock. <laughs> that was brilliant. A win for the Mac Pro there, well and truly. This one will also be interesting. Let's see, the Apple M1 chip. So this is, the, the, the now we're well into the M1, and by the way, just a couple of days ago, they released the uh, M2 Mac Pro. They announced the M2 Mac Pro, which is just absolutely sick. Um, the transition to Apple Silicon is complete, so that is that is just mind-blowing. Um, but yes, we are looking at M1, which is, of course, the slowest, slowest Apple Silicon machine. I've got a feeling the Mac Pro is going to smoke it on this one, to be honest. It's uh, crunching through it a little bit quicker. On metal performance, I was actually expecting the Mac Mini to win. Let's see, it's just, it's all in the numbers. <laughs> this is actually quite tense. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 33,901. Oh my gosh, 33,224. Wow, okay. Wow. So, um, yeah, fantastic. That's crazy. Good old D700, Fire Pro D700. Um, that was an expensive upgrade. I think the D300 and even the D500 would probably be pretty much destroyed by the uh, the little M1, but D700 still still holding its own there. Let's just nip quickly onto Google um, because Fire Pro cards aren't obviously immediately within our databases mentally, let's face it, they're not they're not something that, that people tend to, to use um, here, there and everywhere. So let's just kind of see what the D700 is similar to in terms of um, PC video cards at the moment and see where they stand. I'll try to get a good angle on the screen for you here, guys, because it's an interesting one. So we are looking at an overall ranking of all GPUs. So currently we've got the RTX 4090 100 right at the top. Um, we are going to search D700 and we go right the way down to position 296. And this is what fascinates me out of all these graphics cards, folks, and all these video chips. Look how close the D700 is to the Apple M1 8-core GPU. So the D700 scores 13.64 and 13.73 on the Apple M1 8-core GPU. So that's actually fascinating. Um, GeForce GTX 760 Ti is right there, along with other quite known cards. GeForce GTX 950, the 670 is right there. It's all in this 13 point something, um, around 13.5 mark, 13.6. Uh, let's go up a little bit and see what's a little better. So a 680 and a 690 is a little better. Radeon HD uh, 7970 a little better. So that gives you kind of a ballpark as where the Fire Pro D700 is, but I am flabbergasted to see how close the Apple M M1 GPU is there. Because I mean, look at all these cards, you know, look at all these different, you've got quadros, you've got the laptop chips, you've got absolutely everything in this list. And that's how close they were, the, 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 two, the two systems that we're putting up against each other today. So that's absolutely incredible. Um, I was not expecting that at all. So hats off to the D700, and there's two of them in the Mac Pro. So if you run something that can leverage both of them, then hey, there we go. Um, I did see that they were, where was it? Yeah, they are 274 watt cards. So 
the power supply and the thermals and the cooling and everything in the 2013 Mac Pro is still very impressive considering how much hardware is packed into there. Um, but they do get hot. It creates like a cylinder of hot air above it. It is a very toasty machine. I should imagine that stepping down the GPU tiers, the machine gets slightly cooler when it's under load. Um, okay, that's it for benchmarks because we're just throwing numbers out there now. Um, we're gonna move into something a little bit more fun. So I'm gonna actually swap over my setups. I'm gonna plug the Mac Pro into the big monitor mainly so I can see it easier, but also because it's got a higher resolution, 1920 by 1200 versus 1680 by 1050 on the top monitor. So it's the 16 by 10 equivalent of 1080p essentially. Uh, that allows us to drive a few more pixels in a game that we're gonna run. I'm also gonna swap my speakers into the Mac Pro so we can get some audio. And I'm gonna run the fastest game that I've got that will run on Mac, and that is Alien Isolation. So let's run that, crank it all the way up and see if we can make this Mac Pro GPU stutter in uh, like loads of low frames and stuff in the game. Let's see if we can do it. Now, what I'd really like to do is swap in my main keyboard and mouse as well. Uh, I really don't know how we're gonna do all this. So I want audio. I essentially need to plug my USB hub into the Mac Pro and then plug this video cable into this monitor because this uses the USB-C stuff and this uses Thunderbolt 2 stuff. So. Uh, I'm gonna shut down the Mac Pro because we're gonna be plugging and unplugging things. And as well, getting it on my normal setup, I'll be able to get a feel of the system a lot more. I can obviously feel that it's very snappy, but um, yeah, I still can't quite grasp how it's meant to be feeling because it's such an awkward setup. So I need to get the full effect, man, before I give my final opinions on the machine. Okay, so there's like a courtesy speaker in the Mac Pro, as there is in all the Macs. Let's just change that. To my audio interface. Lovely. Okay, uh, by the way, I do have a video coming on this setup. I know it looks a bit different. I've got some footage from that as well, a bit like I did at the beginning of this video. We'll do like a look back in time and then where we are now sort of thing, because I know things have changed. Uh, right, let's run the game. So here we are running Alien Isolation. I've got the frame counter in the corner, not that I can read it, so uh, sort of. This is the newest game that I have that is supported on Mac, unfortunately. Um, I wouldn't mind something a little bit newer and also something that's a bit easier to dive into because I don't have a save file. So we're like right at the beginning when nothing is happening, but let's just crank it up and see what we can do. I can't sit here and play through this, unfortunately. I've also never finished this game as well. I'd love to, but it's just so bloody hard. Oh man, this is so scary. The music has begun. Um, Hope you like my lovely professional screen capturing. Okay, so let's look at the video settings. Full screen, 1920 by 1200. Yeah, we'll keep V-Sync off for now so that we can get an accurate representation of our frames because this is only a 60 hertz monitor. So ultra, ultra shadow map resolution, ultra, ultra high, on, on, depth of field. Let's see if everything is on, 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 on. You can see all these grayed out arrows, so I can't go any higher on any of this stuff. High, high, ultra, da, 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 da some absolutely badass anti-aliasing, okay. So this should look gorgeous. Now, I booted this the other night when I wasn't filming just to get past all the intro and everything. So I do have a small save file. Continue game, let's go. Come on D700, you can do it. Okay, we're in. Oh, okay. <laughs> 30 frames per second video, so you guys might not be getting this. Let me just set up my phone so that I can zoom in on that frames per second counter so, so that I can read it. You guys might be able to read that on the screen, but I will keep dictating frames anyway. Okay, so we are fluctuating. We're looking at anywhere between 54 and 80 FPS, just standing here, um, which is actually really good because we have this game cranked yeah, walking around, we're on about 70 FPS. So let's have a little look. Let's go places and see what we can do. Taking my shower, yeah, thank you. Lovely, all clean now. Thank you very much. 
So what I'd probably do to get a solid 60 is just crank down some of the more crazy settings. Um, although we're not really into the game yet. So with other characters uh, coming into these sorts of scenes, we're dipping down to 45, 50 FPS. So now with uh, quite a few characters on screen, I'm dipping down to about 39, 38 FPS. Um, but I was expecting guys on these settings for this to be chop, chop all over the place. I believe this, this game is roughly around this time period. Um, I want to say that this is like a 2013, 2014 game. So the fact that the highest end GPU available in the highest end Mac at the time runs the game is not that surprising, I guess. But um, yeah, it is, it is actually really pleasant. About 40 FPS, some of the more complex lighting things going on, we're dipping down. But um, yeah, I'm gonna keep plodding and I'll just see how it is. Oh dear, it's all kicking off now. Um, got to say a couple of things. Firstly, the load times are absolutely horrendous. Um, could just be the game though, but oh my gosh. And also, you can't hear it because my network rack is too loud, um, but the Mac Pro has spun right up. It is really loud. And if I put my, fa uh, my fan, my hand above it, you can feel the airflow pouring out of it. It is like a space heater. The thing is boiling, absolutely boiling. Like it's so hot on the top that one of my kids, if they were to touch that, they'd be like, oh, burn, you know, it's, it's that hot. Um, I can tolerate it, but like someone who is sensitive to heat would not be able to tolerate it. Oh, what's happening? 55 FPS. Ooh. Let's turn it up a little bit. I haven't actually played any games with these monitors. It's sounding really nice. Forty seven FPS, fifty one FPS. Look at that though. How nice does that look? Forty nine FPS. Fifty FPS, forty FPS climbing this ladder, thirty-eight, forty-two. Let's listen to some tunes, man. Go. Ooh. Ooh. Hello. Is there anyone here? Okay, I'm gonna allow myself just a few more minutes walking around here. Because I do wanna chat to you guys. So what I'm going to do at the moment is just have a little look at where our CPU is at. Let's leave that there for a sec. Yeah, check it out guys. The CPU load is next to nothing walking around this game. It's all, uh, it's all on the GPU there. Bigger area, a little bit more complex, down into 55, 59, give or take. I'm here. I'm here. Help. Yeah, check out that CPU just cruising along, guys. <laughs> Mac Pro's a beast. Mac Pro is an absolute beast. Let's do the almost impossible task of trying to summarize all of this. I have been racking my brains on how best to describe this machine and my personal thoughts and feelings about the Mac Pro 2013 overall. So it sat there and I think I know exactly what I'm gonna say. So let's split this up into two main parts. So firstly, let's talk about the value of the machine at the time. So the machine came out in 2013 2013, for 
£2,499 for a quad core. And then it stepped up for the obviously the other configurations like most Mac Pro generations, you've been able to configure it extensively and that alters the price from that base £2,499 or whatever the base price was for any given model and it goes all the way up tens of thousands of pounds um, with the exclusion of the new M2 because you can't actually configure it high enough to exceed like crazy crazy figures that we've seen with the Intel machines which is fascinating um, but the Mac Pro 2013 2499 baseline price and then that was sold all the way up to December 2019 so exactly six years now there's nothing wrong with keeping the one design for six years and obviously continuing to sell it but traditionally Macs are updated every one and a half to two and a half years. So with the Cheese Grater Mac Pro, for instance, you got the 2006 model that came out. Then it had a little refresh, like a lineup refresh in 2007. Then in 2008, it had a generational jump to the next um, series of Intel CPUs. Same thing happened again in 2009. And with each of those models, you saw the faster RAM, you saw the faster interfaces come in and be normal on the machines. Then you saw a minor refresh in 2010, another minor refresh in 2012. Um, so I guess everyone was kind of expecting the 2013 Mac Pro to be updated, but it wasn't. It was released and then it was left. It was just completely left. So it's an Ivy Bridge machine. Came out in 2013, obviously quick, nice blazing fast machine, all the latest and greatest tech, but as the years went on, it became less and less and less of a good value. So if you initially thought it was a good value, not everybody did, but if you did think it was a good value, then obviously that would drop over time. And if you thought it was a bad value on release, it was only getting worse from there because you could still buy that exact same machine in 2017, 2018, which is scary. So. What Apple tried to do is they stuck a plaster on it with the iMac Pro in 2017. I mean, that's a beast entirely of its own, a machine that I'm really not a fan of. Um, but who knows, maybe we'll check out one of those one day. And then, of course, ultimately, the Mac Pro 2013 was then replaced with the Mac Pro 2019, which is going back to the traditional tower, uh, albeit very different to the original cheese grater, but at least you've got expandability back you've got that proper desktop back so that's the pricing that is how bonkers it is you could buy a five six year old platform for full price all those years later and that in itself was just such a bad move such a bad move and no wonder there was such a sour taste about the whole pro thing around that time because it really does look like neglect um, Apple obviously have their fingers in lots of pies these days, but to just leave that Pro machine rotting away there for all that time with no update was crazy. If you think about it, if the machine released in 2013 as an Ivy Bridge machine, uh, like it did, and it had all the connectivity you needed and all the expansion you needed and ticked all the boxes, but you thought, oh, I'll wait until next year's refresh or I'll wait until the 2015 refresh, I'll save up a little bit of dosh, let's grab it in 2015. It wasn't happening, was it? It never got refreshed. So if you didn't buy it in 2013 or 2014, right at the very beginning, that value was, that was slipping away. It made less and less sense. And all the other Macs around it were being updated all the time. And it didn't take long for the iMac to be like, hey, pff, Mac Pro, the iMacs were just blazing out in front, you know, and then even the MacBook Pros, and it was just looking horrendous. So the fact that they brought the proper Tower Mac Pro back in 2019 was absolutely fantastic. And like I briefly mentioned earlier, the fact that we now have the M2 Mac Pro is so, so cool. That transition is complete, and we are sticking with a proper desktop form factor we don't have any silly, crazy, weird shaped objects going on that are trying to be all clever with, with tons and tons of compromises because of that design choice. So that leads us in nicely to the second point. We've discussed the price and the value. It's left out there for debate, but nobody can deny that kind of long time period where that value drops. The second point and the much more, I guess, intriguing point is the main question of the entire thing. When you consider the Mac Pro, when you, when you think about it, you have to just ask, did the machine ever need to exist? And I'm pretty certain the answer is no. 
let's face it, now that we're out the other side and the machine has been off the shelves for four years or so, did it ever need to be? I really don't think it did. So let's rewind to 2012. We have the cheese grater Mac Pro, the proper tower machine there. They've been updating it. They could have just updated it for Ivy Bridge. They could have put an SSD in it. There was nothing stopping them doing that. They could have retained the four hard drive bays. They could have retained the PCI slots, retained that expansion, even retained the optical drive bays or one bay if they wanted to at the time. They could have, they could have chosen to do that, keep the same case design, tweak the case design, who knows? But they would have ended up with a lovely machine and they could have just kept updating it, kept updating it. But no, they dumped a load of R&D into the trash can and then we got the trash can. Now, what makes the form factor of the trash can so silly? Well, obviously, a lot of the cost of that machine is that ridiculous cooling, the whole thermal core thing, the crazy power supply, and all the engineering that went into making that machine work. Now, similarly to the Power Mac G4 Cube, nobody can deny that it is a lovely machine. 2013 Mac Pro, lovely machine. That, From a design perspective, from an engineering perspective, absolutely lovely. It's like nothing else out there. But in practical terms, it makes absolutely no sense because it costs so much to develop the machine. It was a ridiculous concept to begin with. But by doing all of that and making it so physically tiny, Apple backed themselves right into a corner and there was no room for anything in the machine. So I always think that it's a miracle that they managed to get full-size DIMM slots in the Mac Pro. Um, it's great that you can upgrade the RAM. If you couldn't upgrade the RAM, it would have been an utter failure. So RAM upgrade, great. Everything else, absolutely terrible. Yes, it was the first Mac Pro with Thunderbolt and that was a huge deal. Thunderbolt has, has been tremendous over the years, absolutely brilliant. Um, but no PCIe, no hard drive bays. And yes, it's the same old thing over and over again. Everybody says it. It's a sticking point, but of course it is. That was the technology that people wanted at the time. So why was there no need to make it physically smaller? Why was there no need to put it into a nice svelte cylinder of, of, of crazy tech goodness? Why, why did they not need to do that? Well, all you have to do is look at the use cases for, this, for the Mac Pro. Look at the people that are buying the Mac Pro. So let's take a couple of random examples. Let's take a recording studio. They want a Mac Pro because they want to track all these tracks. They want to use all these plugins. They want a really fast machine. They want loads of RAM. They want storage in the box. They want PCIe capability, or at least at the time they did. Um, do they care about a large tower? No, because all the other equipment in the studio is bigger than a desktop computer anyway. They've got racks and racks of equipment, big mixing desks, speakers, huge items. They're surrounded by all this stuff. Having a tower on the floor under the desk that nobody notices is not gonna make any difference. So do those pros benefit from having a crazy little cylinder? No, but they have to put up with the fact that they can't buy a 2013 Mac Pro because it doesn't have the expansion that they need for them to integrate the machine into their workflow. Okay, so that's recording studios out. Another really good example is anything touring. So anything where you need to put the Mac Pro into a flight case. A super common thing that is done by loads and loads of pros, anything on, basically anything on the road, using it for like video work or visualization stuff, anything in the concert industry. You wanna take the Mac Pro along with you, cheese grater Mac Pro tower, stick it on its side, rack shelf, bang, in a case, clamp it in, job done. Sits in there lovely, you can fit drives in it, you can fit cards in it, you can plug everything into it that you want to plug in, firewire stuff, network stuff, brilliant. It's all there. 2013 Mac Pro, it's round, so you can't really stick it anywhere. You've kind of got to buy a special expensive third-party rack bracket and then when you do put that in your rack case it's taking up loads and loads of room and you're not even getting drives in there. You've got to handle all of that externally. You've got to have all these adapters coming out the back of the rack plugging in all these different external things. Um, more points of failure. It's not all in the box. Do they benefit from having a smaller device? No, just like the recording studio. Have you seen the size of their equipment? They do not care about a small machine. Desktop tower, not a problem. Stick it in, everything else is massive anyway. Now, looking at a less extreme example, video editing. And uh, I guess this really depends on the, the kind of type of video editors, the, the size of the company and everything. But this is the way that I see it. For, for let's say any other purpose, any other professional use for the machine. 
you're sitting there in front of presumably quite a big monitor anyway, so like a 27 inch monitor, and maybe you've got some quite big speakers or you've got some other big equipment on the desk. Do you really care about how small your computer is? I don't think so, because it's a tower. It can just go on the floor under the desk or you can stick it over there somewhere or on the table there and, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is the size never mattered. Pros weren't shouting at Apple saying, hey, we want a smaller Mac Pro. They were shouting at Apple saying, hey, update the Mac Pro. These are the features we want. So that sacrifice was almost a complete wrong turn, a complete misdirection. So if you could go left or you could go right, Apple should have chosen left, they chose right. So they left a huge percentage of the pros completely in the dust. People had to drag cheese graters along or switch to PCs or switch to iMacs. That happened all over the place. It really, really did, especially iMacs. iMacs were popping up everywhere because it, it didn't take long before they were quicker than the 2013 Mac Pro. It really didn't. And the machine made more sense. You know, if you're gonna buy a small machine that has limited expansion, why not get one with a beautiful built-in monitor for less money? It just made sense. So that is the summary. The Mac Pro 2013, undoubtedly an amazing engineering accomplishment and a gorgeous machine to look back on. Lovely, crazy, out there design in a way that only Apple could have ever done. But the machine was pretty much always bad value. There was always a better choice. And nobody asked for it to be like that. Nobody actually wanted it. So I think sometimes when you see the quantity of 2013 Mac Pros on eBay, obviously it's kind of hard to tell exactly how many Mac Pro 2013s they sold. But when you see how many are out there, um, you have to think, wow, wow, people bought this. People really did buy this. And I think a lot of them must have come from the fact that, oh, okay, this is the next Mac Pro. Here's the new budget for this financial year. Yeah, let's do it. We've always bought the Power Macs. We always bought the Mac Pros. Now let's buy the Mac Pro again. Um, maybe a, a few waves of trash cans made their way into businesses before iMacs did. Um, crazy stuff. And something that I find flabbergasting is they made these decisions and they had an exact template of these exact decisions 10 years prior. So they had the Power Mac towers and they thought, let's make a small, compact, quarter the size, little tiny itty bitty cute desktop, put on your desk, looks lovely, pro machine. Let's release that and see how it goes. Went terribly. Again, gorgeous machine, but the pros didn't want it. It was the exact same thing with the Mac Pro 2013, but worse because that was the only Mac Pro you could choose. At least with the Power Mac G4s, it was sold alongside the proper tower that had all the upgradability. So you could just choose not to buy the Cube. Or you could buy the Cube if the Cube suited you. But there wasn't that choice. You basically just had the modern version of the Cube in 2013 and that was it. So they're my overall thoughts and feelings. And they've been my thoughts pretty much the whole time the Mac Pro has existed. This video, this like experimenting and stuff that we've done with the machine has, has not changed my view at all because all of this is based on what the machine fundamentally is and not how it performs. Because we all know how it performs. It's, it, it's a beefy system from the Ivy Bridge era. We know the tech that's under the hood. We know how it's gonna perform. That's not the issue. And that's kind of what we've tested in this video. Obviously we had a lovely surprise with the, the D700 GPUs really pulling their weight, which was absolutely awesome. And you know, it was really nice to feel how snappy the machine is 10 years later, but hey, my daily driver laptop is a 2013 MacBook Pro and it still feels snappy today. You know, there is not that need as such to constantly upgrade now. Um, because the machines from 10 years ago are still, are still clinging on. So what am I going to do with it? Well, I've got absolutely no idea. So my plan is I'm going to ask you guys right now, if I've missed anything out, or if you want me to check out anything specific about this Mac Pro, please leave a comment down below and we'll do it. I've got the machine. I've got the machine here. I bought it to make videos about. So if there's anything specific that you guys want to see me do with the Mac Pro, comment down below and I'll try and get it done. Outside of that, I have absolutely no idea. The machine has dipped in value since I purchased it, and I think uh, it's only gonna continue to plummet. Now, on that topic, now that we've got the M2 Mac Pro, the transition is complete, 
things are going to be a little interesting for Intel over the next couple of years and the overall value and longevity of the Intel machines. Nothing concerning, obviously, quite yet. We're still not early, but definitely not at the end of the whole transition period. But what I will say, if you're looking to buy one of these 2013 Mac Pros, if you want one on the shelf, if you've been eager to get one as part of your collection, but you haven't really wanted to spend out the hundreds of pounds that they kind of still command, um, don't pull the trigger anytime soon, just wait because the bottom is gonna drop out and they're gonna, they're gonna go down. They may climb back up fairly quickly. Um, so it's worth keeping an eye on them. It definitely is, but I presume there's a lot more of these out there than there are G4 cubes. And even the G4 cube isn't in crazy, crazy numbers uh, in terms of get, getting your hands on one. You know, you can find cubes. I think it's gonna be a long time until you can't find the Mac Pro 2013. So any collectors, I know there's a lot of collectors that watch my channel. Um, just hold off, hold off on the 2013 Mac Pro. Possibly I should have done it, I should have held off, but I'm kind of glad I didn't because it's 10 years. We've had 10 years of this machine now. It's the anniversary and the new Mac Pro has just been released. So the timing was pretty much perfect. I'm chuffed that we've been able to check it out now. So that is it crazy ramble. I cannot wait to put my massive fan back on, so I'm going to stop this video. I really hope you've all enjoyed. It's lovely to be back. Really enjoy making this stuff, so if you guys enjoy as well, just comment down below. Give me a little thumbs up just to show me that you're still out there. Um, I do apologise once again for the delay, but hey, I hope it's worth it, and I hope I can continue to get some stuff out. I've got some lovely plans, so I've just got to find time to do it all now. Hope you've all enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video.